Today's episode is brought to you by the folks over at SeatGeek, the best and easiest to use ticket platform out there. They take the confusion out of buying tickets using a 0 to 10 scoring system and a green is good, red is bad color rating system so you and your loved ones get the best deal possible. So whether it's going to see our beloved Red Legs at Great American Ballpark, the Bengals over at Paycor, FC Cincinnati, one of the area college teams, or pretty much anything in between, use promo code RIVERFRONT at checkout and receive $20 off your first order. Click the link in the show notes to download the app and get started. That's Riverfront, one word, for 20 bucks off. Tim Daniel. His name is Ben Brown, and welcome to the finale. Is this the season? Do we call this the season finale? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. season okay. finale. All right, welcome season to this finale. season finale edition of Late Night Reds here on the Riverfront. This is our <laughs> final show of the year. As you see, we do have some guests on the beneath us. We'll have plenty of more guests later, uh, but we'll get to them just a second. I want to make sure we give a quick shout out, as always, to our Patreon fam who make this possible every week, where you can also be a member at patreoncom riverfront Cincy and Ben. We have, looking right now, before we get started, we have not even started the show yet. We have our largest live audience we've ever had on a show oh, right now. Okay. We haven't even said awesome. hi yet. Well, I guess, we did awesome. the, I guess we did the hello, everybody. But uh, <laughs> uh, So we're going to have a big, fun draft. Our two guys here, they're going to kind of help us a little bit with some ideas of like the draft thought process and potential ice guys we can look at as well. But And then we'll, of course, have our fantastic Christmas draft here in about a half hour, which we already have a couple guys in the queue that are like, I'm just so excited. I had to. Had to go ahead and log on. I can't wait. But let's go ahead and introduce these guys first down behind us. Also, first, if you are checking out our college stuff, you check us out at RiverfrontCincy.com. You've seen this guy's name quite a bit. He is our Miami, Ohio beat writer covering football and basketball for us. Mr. Jack Mueller. Jack, how are you, buddy? Welcome to the show. I'm fabulous. Thank you guys for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Does uh, Do you get on Travis's nerves yet like I used to yet? Not quite. Um, okay. I'm not quite there yet, but give me a couple more weeks. I'm sure I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. That's my guy. That's my guy. Have actually, before the season started, if you check out our YouTube channel here, have a great interview with Travis. I did. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Travis Steele being the head coach of Miami of Ohio. And Ben, fellow Boone County alumni in the house with us tonight. Yes, sir. Putting on for the, for the high school. Yeah, no doubt, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, former, hey, former Boone County alumni and also – Former um, student aide as well. Yeah. You know what I mean, yeah. Jackson represented. Yeah. Go. I was the OG. So there we go. <laughs> he is uh, MLB scout, current owner of DBRAT, DBAT Baseball Training in Hebron, Kentucky. One of our favorite people, Jackson Lauman. I, I, Jackson signed to play baseball at the University of Cincinnati. So I let that slide. Yeah. So, so I, like, yeah. I like him enough. So we get pa- we get past that little issue and we're good friends. So what's up, buddy? I think we've been like trying to get you on here for a couple months now. So I'm glad we finally to make it work. I know. I appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. And obviously me and Tim, old buddies, and, and Ben's kind of been, you know, a, a man of many hats for me, a, a, a friend and a, a, a role model and a father figure. So super excited to kind of get back with you guys and, and be a part of this. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And 
Same thing for me. So, like, that's why I was like, I guess I'll let Ben be on the show. With me. <laughs> actually, funny story. The thing was actually like I had been on like three or four episodes and Chad and Nate were like, why don't you see if he wants to be your co-host full time? And I was like, yep, that's going to be happen. That's going to happen. Let, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Jackson, before we get started real quick, tell us a little bit about DBAT training facility what you guys do how your your system works and uh, when we can go and take some hacks in the cage yeah absolutely so dbat um you know it's been a project for for myself and my dad for a while now um uh, like you said i played professionally for a little bit and i was a dbat player rep so at the time they made wood bats things like that um and, and i just kind of always felt like this area kind of needed a real state of the art facility. So it's been something that, that we've kind of dreamed up and, and been excited to, to be a part of. And, and um, yeah, so we, we offer kind of anything and everything. So we have a fully stocked about 4,000 square foot pro shop, um, aluminum bats, wood bats, kind of all the accessories and gear apparel, you name it, you know, we got it. Uh, we have 15, 15 cages, uh, three pitching machines that throw both baseballs and softballs. We offer memberships. We do lessons and camps and clinics and team rentals. So it's just kind of a something that we had always wanted to do and, and kind of bring back home to, to Northern Kentucky and be able to kind of provide, you know, a facility for, for the younger generation to, to keep going and stay in the sport. That's awesome, man. I know when you, before you opened, I got a chance to tour the, the facility is beautiful. Thank it's you. Awesome. It's full. Uh, it's great. My only issue is you guys aren't selling Topps baseball cards in there yet. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> my only issue. I'm sure we'll be there. I'm yeah. sure we'll get there. But my yeah. only issue is my kids stop playing baseball two years. <laughs> Gosh dang it. <laughs> yeah. We talked about that last week after Otani signed a seven hundred million dollar contract yeah. the first sixty eight million a year. Um so so yeah, like we said, Jackson's been a has been a scout in the big leagues for a short time. Um Jack, actually, even though he's our Miami of Ohio writer, he also did a summer working in the Cape Cod League. So some of these guys were going to talk about the Reds options at number two overall. He's seen some of them play, so it's going to be nice to kind of get that insight as well. And the idea with this is we're just going to talk about four or five guys that are up there, guys we could see potentially as options there, if we like the idea, if we don't, um, and kind of go from there. And or you know, if we don't know the guy, which, look, let's be honest, it's very early in the draft cycle, that's okay too. I took this off Mayo's pipeline. So we'll uh, we'll talk about some guys with her. We'll see how it goes. But I did want to start, obviously, with uh, I think I've texted all three of you individually about this guy already. So I felt like he was the guy I wanted to start with. And that is J.J. Weatherholt, second and third baseman out of West Virginia, won the NCAA Division One batting title this past year, has raked at every level he's played at. Um, and then I saw Mayo discuss that he's likely going to play shortstop this year at West Virginia, which like. It's a red it's a red scout dream, right? Shortstops, like they're like, oh, you you play shortstop, you're on my team. Um, and Jackson, when the Reds got the second pick, I text you first. I was like, okay, what can you tell me about JJ Weatherholt? And you said, rakes, just nothing but rakes. Yeah, th this kid. So you know, I'm fortunate enough with the area I cover. I, I cover the state of West Virginia, so I've seen JJ a lot. And that's, I mean, a, a lot of guys. You look at the you know, the holistic thing to tools that they bring to the game. Um, and really like ev everything's great, how physical they are, you know, defensive ability. Um, but at the end of the day, what gets guys to the big leagues and what keeps them there is if they hit. Um, and, and this kid just, it, it's all he's ever done. I mean, like you said, he hit, you know, 449 last year, led NCAA, um, sneaky powers had like, uh, I believe it was 16 home runs, um, controls the strike zone. Like, Nobody does really struck out less than I think it was like eight percent. So just kind of everything you're looking for in a hitter, um, especially a hitter with potential. Uh, and then and then on the flip side of that, you know, to, when you're selecting somebody that high in the draft, obviously they have to do both. So the defensive side is like he is an up the middle athlete. Um, he he will play shortstop for them this year. Long term, it's probably more of a second base, third base play. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of buying the fact that no matter where this kid is going to go, he's going to hit and he's going to be the staple in the middle, you know, of a major league lineup, you know, in a couple years to come. So, so, um, Jack, I'll get your thoughts on him as well here in a second. Um, Jack Jackson, you can kind of speak on this really well. The baseball draft so unique in this situation because 
you know, look at Hunter Green. Hunter Green was probably the best player in that draft, and the Reds got him at two because of negotiations and slot and things like that. Um, I can't remember who went number one. That it, Tampa had the pick that year is what I remember. Um, but in this situation, what are the chances you feel he doesn't drop to the Reds and Cleveland takes him at one? You know, it's really hard to tell. Uh, unlike, like you said, with without the other drafts, in the sports, there's such a delay between when these guys are selected and when they impact the actual team that, that took them, you know, football, they're, they're on the team the next year, same with basketball. So, you know, you're looking at a three, four year timeline, typically guys move quicker or slower. Um, but you really, you're not really drafting primarily for need in the baseball draft. It's kind of like best player available is typically how it's approached. Um, and that's that everybody views that differently. Um, so some organizations, there's just different philosophies and different ways they want to do it. Um, especially now the way that the draft has been kind of reworked with money. Obviously that, that plays a huge part um, in how, how teams want to play later in the draft. When you have that much of a bonus pool to work with, um, you know, you can get creative and, Hey, we're going to save a little here. We're going to spend it a little bit later on. So there, there's, there's different ways to do it. Um, typically going into a draft season, the top two, three, four guys kind of stay there. The order is always shuffled to some degree. Um, there's not really a lot of instances where a kind of a nobody name has a great year and finds himself being the first pick in the draft. Um, so there, that, that one to five order you know, it's kind of flip a coin on how it's shuffled, especially if these guys go out and kind of perform the way that they have the last couple of years. So cool. Jack, Wish I had a better answer for you, but it's, no, it's that's, just, that's great because really know, where else are you going to get that insight is what we're kind of looking for in that circumstance. Right. So, uh, Jack, anything you want to touch on JJ before we move to the next prospect? No, Jackson absolutely hit the nail on the head. The kid just mashes. I mean, you look at his stats from West Virginia this year, he had 1300 OPS that, is hard to come by. And then you look at his stats on the Cape. That's a wood bat league. That's where a lot of MLB scouts are looking to see how these guys are going to perform the next level. And he just performed as well. He had 320 with a 978 OPS. Like these are big league numbers. These are, this is a pro ready prospect. This is probably one of the best pure hitters in the draft. And I would be surprised if he falls past the Reds at two. Yeah. yeah and on top of that, had 36 stolen bases this past year. So, I mean, he can move too. So, I mean, mm -hmm. You're speaking so, my language great. there. I love guys who can just, <laughs> just ruin a base path for defensive teams. Love that. Yeah. Absolutely love that. Um, so Jack told me specifically about this guy he saw in the Cape League, so I wanted to really get his thoughts for on for sure on him. Uh, Travis Mazana, second baseman at Oregon State. Uh, you kind of said, Jack, that you – correct. I might be paraphrasing and saying what's wrong here, so you can correct me if I'm saying this incorrectly. But you felt like Travis was a little bit better of a potential upside player than J.J.? Was I wrong when you said that? I think that he has shown more over a more prolonged period of time than JJ has. Okay. This is a guy that came out of Australia as a highly touted prospect and has done nothing but perform. Came into Oregon State and has hit, I think it's about 340 over his two years in Oregon State. He's a pure contact hitter. Went out to Falmouth and was the MVP of the Cape League. Again, if you perform in the Cape League, it's a good indicator of a pro-level prospect. I think he's got a lower or a higher floor than JJ. I think JJ is probably at the MLB level going to be a better overall hitter, but I think Travis projects as a guy that can play second base for the next 10 years and be a pretty solid contact bat. Yeah. Jackson, did you see him play at all? I have not seen him though. No. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I know that like I looked up the numbers on these guys after I talked to you guys, cause you guys are far smarter at this than Ben and I are for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and it was another guy I was pretty impressed with, but I don't know. I think I just lean Weatherhole, but I'm not going to be mad if they take him here. You know, if they, if they get Bazana here. But, um, you know, obviously Oregon State's a very high-touted college baseball program. So I got to like that. And you mentioned playing in the Cape League uh, gets a lot of upside there. So um, I know the conversation about this draft is a lot of like, it's not what last year's draft was, but it seems like that, like that group that kind of Jackson mentioned, the four or five are kind of like pretty solid. And that was a guy that is probably in that four or five. So. Yeah, yeah, I think I what mean, stuck out about. Crazy. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just I, looking at stuff here. So, I, you know, I looked at the numbers as well. I think what stuck out to me with Bazana that was the most intriguing was 
like his exit velocities and how hard he impacts the baseball is just like, I mean, it's unreal. And that typically, when you talk about guys in a draft room that are all really, really good and all obviously have crazy upside and you're, you know, talking about multi-million dollar deals and it's like, it, it ends up being some of those little details and kind of, you know, the tiebreakers and it's the, it's the exit velocities. It's some of the, you know, mental performance testing that they do with these kids. And it's just like, th- those are the things that usually can push a guy over the edge. And I think, you know, the conversations will be had with the, any shortcomings that are going to be discussed about him is like at the end of the, at the end of the day, how hard he hits the baseball is going to, just it's going to buy him a lot more time just because that's what big leaguers do is they hit the ball really hard. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, I love both players. What I've seen of them so far. So I'm excited. This is where it kind of gets interesting. Um, so Nick Kurtz had a wake forest. The thing that's really interesting here is the reds have done pretty well in the whole wake forest thing in years past. Uh, just this year on the team, obviously best player on the team, Stuart Fairchild. Wake Forest alum. Uh, and then obviously they took Rhett Louder this year in the, with the first overall pick. And Kurtz is a guy that's getting a lot of love from a lot of different sites out there, whether it's just baseball, whether it's Mayo with MLB Pipeline. But you don't often, it was Torkelson the last time you saw a quarter infielder go, with a, go this high in a draft. So I don't know if he's a guy that goes there, but everything I've seen from him, I like a lot. Yeah, I think if if anyone's going to go and take Torkelson's mantle, it will be Kurtz. All of the metrics that I've seen have said that he's a fantastic hitter and he's performed at every level he's been at so far. Uh, again, I again, like you said, I don't love the fact that we're talking about taking a corner infielder in the first two picks in the draft because it limits his versatility going forward. But if we're talking about pure hitters, he's up there on the same level as J.J., did you... So, so when you talk about when we talk about taking a corner infielder like a, a first, but so is it better to take middle infielders, outfielders because of their versatility? If if they hit better, is that is that something that you're looking for? Is if you're if you're looking for somebody to draft that high? Not necessarily. I'm just looking at draft performances at that pick in the last couple of years. Gotcha. Corner infielders don't usually go that high. Gotcha. Um. I, I think Nick Kurtz more than warrants a spot and more than warrants a look in that spot. But just looking at draft history, corner infielders don't usually go that high. They would have to take a really special prospect to go that high. Yeah, you're talking like the the Joey Gallo esque type of of left handed hitter, like the elite power, you know, raw power, bat to ball skills. And I think that's kind of where he makes up for it as well a little bit too. Is you know he controls the strike zone really well for a huge power hitter, which is typically one of their flaws is they're going to swing and miss a lot, which he doesn't really do. Um, But to kind of answer your question, Ben, like when you're evaluating two players um, that offensively, let's just say are very same metrics, performance projection, you're going to err on the side of the, what we call like the up the middle player, the, the shortstop second base center fielder, typically because they're a little more athletic Um, over the course of a year, the majority of the balls are hit that way. You want them to make more plays. Um, They're, they're just a little, there's just more value in, you know, the short stops and center fielders. Um, Also you have a little bit more wiggle room in like the what if scenarios, like if you draft a corner outfielder um, and let's just say they're not hitting you're kind of you're stuck a little bit whereas Mm -hmm. you get the shortstop that hits but let's say he gets a little bit bigger and stronger as he matures now he slows down a little bit you kind of still have that secondary option of okay we can move him off of this position still get value out of him somewhere else on the field rather than being kind of limited to you know he's a what we call like first base only right field only things like that where it's like That's all he can really do. We're kind of sticking him there. He's really got a rake or he's got to hit, you know, he's got to have ISO numbers through the roof, whatever it may be, where you just get more versatility, especially the way the game's going is there's, you know, there's a lot more teams that are using that, you know, what we call a super utility role. It's like the guy who one day is in left and he's at short and he's at second. Then he's, yeah, Yeah. that's becoming 
a big part of the game and just being able to manipulate the lineup and have guys bounce around a little bit just to kind of add value, give other guys a day off or a break. Um, and just kind of that's, that's becoming a, a very versatile spot. Well, without giving Jack away here for the fact he works for a Cincinnati sports site and is a Chicago in, um, <laughs> he's probably the last time a team has kind of hit really well, super high in the draft on a corner infielder. Right. Would you yeah. say Brian, yeah. Brian definitely worked out for us where I would not take that back that pick and <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm happy with how that one turned out. Yeah. You know, an MVP, a World yeah, he, Series. He did all right. right. Yeah, he did all right, right from himself. Yeah. <laughs> his, like, I don't know. Would you say his, he had a drop off of what he's done since then? Or is it just like a weird situation where, like, he's playing in Colorado now, where I thought, like, I never thought Chris Bryant would be like a Colorado Rocky. It's just a weird, like, uniform on player kind of thing. Yeah. So after we won the World Series, there was a whole thing, like, Chris Bryant has the trajectory to be the best. Cubs baseball player we've ever seen. And then he just got ravished with injuries. Like it was back injury, leg injury, back back to back. And he just never really was the same player after that. Like he just could not find the same form that he had in 2016. So it broke Chicago's hearts to let him go. But in reality, we were never going to match the contract that Colorado gave him. And the value we got out of the trade with San Francisco, like Owen Casey, I think was the return in that deal is now a top 10 prospect. So yeah, he did. He was a fantastic player for the Cubs. We will, we will have him in deep in our hearts for the rest of our lives. But you know, can't be mad at it. Yeah, don't worry, Jack. I'll make sure Chad doesn't fire you. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> uh, a couple more prospects before we kind of get to get on here. Um, Charlie Condon from Florida, outfielder, first baseman. You know why I like him? He's lefty, lefty. Give me team lefty all day. Every day, let's go. Um, uh, don't really know much. I mean, obviously, playing in the SEC, Jax, is he a guy you got to see much at all because of where you're located? Um, I did not see Georgia, I've, I've obviously heard the name. Um, but no, I didn't see him live personally. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen a whole lot of him. I should, I know, but uh, was obviously a name there, so didn't know if anyone had any insight there. If not, no big deal. Like I said, we're super early in this process, so. Yeah, I mean, just looking at his raw numbers, I haven't seen a whole yeah. lot of film on him, but 25 home runs in the SEC is legit. He was the yeah, he had some really good there. numbers. I've seen a couple of clips on him on Twitter where he just hits the ball an absolute mile. In a couple of the mocks, he falls as far as like the mid teens. I don't think he gets that far. I think he's a fantastic hitter, but yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on. I don't think he's going to get as high as number two for the Reds, but he's he's legit. This is a name arc like community is super high on if you check through the, like the riverfront slack channel which you can become a member of if you go to patreon.com slash riverfront cincy um jack i'm gonna say his name wrong Kegliane, first base and left-hander out of florida i feel like anytime this conversation has come up since the lottery he's a guy that everyone's talked about for the reds does anyone know why and i'm not saying anything bad about him. i'm not saying he's a bad player because it seems like everyone's stoked about him but like i'm not gonna lie I love the guys that are getting at starting pitchers in the first round. Kind of bored drafting pitchers. I'll tell you what. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this one on you a little bit. Left-handed, up to a hundred with 33 home runs at the oh, plate. Oh, okay, okay. Now, now, I see what you're now, saying. Yeah. Now here's the thing with this one is like I think when he broke out early, it was like unanimous first pick you know his draft year like wasn't even a question now obviously he was held to probably too high of a standard um i did see this one live so he played at uh university of kentucky on an sec weekend um this this kid's a freak physically um uh, just just strength in both halves on the mound now he's touched some 99s and 100 from the left side it's funky it's a three-quarter slot uh, he sits more 92, 95, touches six here and there. The 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 big velos have been kind of like random pitches. He's not sitting there. Um, ultimately, I do think he ends up being a hitter. Um, it's just – it's really hard. And I know Tani just signed the deal, and that's kind of like where everybody goes, especially with this guy. Um, it's just – it's hard from an organizational standpoint to – 
develop and kind of have guys move through a system doing both things. Now, Otani came over from a league where he had already acquired that. He had kind of had everything down. But when you're talking about, you know, a college prospect, a 21, 22-year-old kid that still has three or four years, you know, the, the minor league systems and player player programs and plans are so advanced now, <clears throat> excuse me, that it's hard to keep guys on. Like, pitchers show up to the ballpark at a different time. There's different, you know, lifts that they do specifically for different muscles. They run different schedules, things like that. Um, so, so trying to balance and draft a guy saying, Hey, we're going to allow him to do both. Um, now obviously this guy is very special at both. So that conversation is going to be had. And if you're going to take him this high in the draft, you probably are going to try to get the value out of him on both sides. Um, it's just, it is very difficult to kind of maintain that level as you advance, especially into the big leagues, which I think just kind of goes and gives credit, not that Otani needs more credit. I think his paycheck gives him enough there. But <laughs> to show how hard it is, because there's really nobody else that does it, especially at that level. Um, but but this kid is physically, statistically, um, the, the upside, it's, it's all real. It's just kind of like what organization, A, is willing to, to pay for it, and B, can manage it and try to get the most out of his ability. All right, Jackson, you convinced me. He's two on the board now behind J.J. Weatherhold for me now. <laughs> you got me. I'm in. I'm in. There we go. Yeah. Jack, any additions? Have you seen him at all? Or are you kind of – I mean, Jackson hit the nail on the head. Like, if anyone's going to come out of this draft and be special and be a two-way guy, it's going to be him. Um, like you said, I think he projects more as a hitter. But the pitching numbers are there. He has good velocity. The control is a little bit of a, an issue for me. But – if anyone's going to be a two-way guy in this draft, it's going to be him. And he's definitely worth a look. I'm not sure he's going to maintain the same level of hype or production, but he's definitely one to keep an eye on. Dumb question from like just being a fan who complains on social media. Um, with a guy like that, does the Brendan McKay situation kind of make you wonder if like you should take a chance where he's kind of had a lot of these injuries? Do, and he was drafted by Tampa to be a kind of a two-way player? At least for me, no. I think there's okay. two very different players. I mean, sure. Three, three home runs in the SEC speak for itself. I don't think Brendan McK- I, I I'd have to double check, but I'm pretty sure Brendan McKay didn't have that. And Caglioni pitched in the College World Series, I think. I'd have to double check, but he he still shoved and shoved in some close season games. And I don't think McKay had the same level of pedigree that he did. Okay. Uh, like I said, this is me just kind of not knowing better as I asked that question. So. Yeah, Brendan McKay actually never – he was a tough one. I, you know, I covered that area as well. And it was like big power bat from the left side, but he never actually had a ton of um, – like the raw power was there, but there wasn't ever like a big, huge number. I think he hit – I mean, look, 18, you know, his draft eligible year, which is still great, but I mean, this kid hit 33. So it's like – and I think – the athleticism is probably a, a little, if not a lot, okay. where um, Caglianone is more of a, a long, stringy, um, filled out, like chance to be just very physical, where Brendan McKay was kind of a stocky, strong, kind of probably probably the same body he is now as he was, you know, as a junior in college. So there's a little bit more to dream on, definitely in terms of the upside and the athlete. Um, with Kaglian on than there was McKay. But on the flip, it's kind of, for me, it's a little bit flipped where I take the bat of Kaglian on if I have to pick, where I took the arm of Brendan McKay if I had to pick. Um, He was a little more crafty, threw better strikes, uh, better breaking ball, a couple more weapons, just kind of knew how to work the top of the zone. You know, Kaglian on had a great year, but he is, like Jack said, kind of a you know, flame throwing lefties, secondary stuff's a little soft. Strikes are kind of come and go, which is why, you know, I think the majority of, of scouts are probably leaning towards the, the hit tool here and the power potential. Um, a little bit different players, in my opinion, the, the Brendan McKay situation and the guys that are like, hey, this is a, you know, a, a high level two way performer at the college level and then go out with expectations to kind of continue to do both that, that 
ultimately struggled, had to kind of pick one way. Now, he was probably more faulted a little bit by injury there than anything, but it's definitely in the minds of, of the decision makers who go through this of just like, like I said earlier, like how, how are we going to manage this? You know, what's the risk? Do they outweigh the reward? Um, and just kind of figuring out what works best for, for the individual ball club. Okay, cool. And then what I'm putting these guys up before we get to our next segment, this is uh, kind of the other names that Mayo had listed. Just didn't want to go another 30 minutes, talk about five more guys. So uh, Vance Honeycutt, outfielder in North Carolina. Tommy White, quarter infielder out of LSU. Connor Griffin out of Jackson Prep. The first time I've seen a high school guy this low in a draft in forever. And that's still top 10, of course. Seaver King, kind of that up the middle player Jackson talked about, another Wake Forest guy. And then Braden Montgomery, outfielder and right-handed pitcher out of Texas A&M. You guys have anything to add on any of these guys at all? You just want to go ahead and get on to the fun stuff. I'll, I'll add real fast. I think if there's any name I had to just pick out of these five that maybe don't get the two, but definitely sneak into the conversations would be Connor Griffin for me. Okay. Um, I saw him this summer. Um, I saw him both on the dirt and in the outfield, but it's just a very athletic um, just kind of a really projection filled, like upside play, really good athlete, honestly does kind of everything. He runs, he throws, he has power, good swing decisions, doesn't punch out much, put together a great summer on the circuit. That's, that's typically tough, you know, for high school hitters to do because you're facing a fresh, you know, 95, 96, 97 high school arm every time you're in the box. Um, but, but he's a guy kind of falls into that category of, Maybe maybe the now tools and now performance don't put him as high as, you know, pick two, but you could maybe shave some money compared to those high-end college prospects. So now you take, you know, him in the top five and get a little bit cheaper deal. So you have a little bit more room to work with a little later in the draft, things like that. That's probably um, probably the first high school name off the board. And a guy that that could start to climb the ladder come you know the spring of twenty four. Cool. Yeah, I know the last time the Reds took a high school guy was uh, Austin Hendrick, and uh, it sounds like from what I read, things are not going very well in his projections to make the big leagues. So, yeah, I think hopefully this is one. I think this one's probably going to be a little better than that, from what I from what I'm reading. So. All right, let's go ahead. Jack, you want to add anything before we get go to the next segment? The only thing I was going to add is that I'm very high on Honeycutt. I'm very high on King. I think they're both very good hitters. Honeycutt's probably a better fielder than King, but they both have really good hit tools. The only one I've seen in person is Montgomery. He pitched against my Firebirds in 2022 in the playoffs and just mowed us down. Like It was, <laughs> it was three up, three down, 99-mile-an-hour fastball, wipeout slider. We didn't stand mm. a chance, and that's when our playoff run ended. So. All three of those guys are legit. All three of those guys are names to keep an eye on. Nice. Well, cool. Well, awesome. I really well, not awesome for you. Not awesome for you. <laughs> no, it's, 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 a tough day. it's a tough day. You know. <laughs> well, I really appreciate you guys kind of giving us that insight from what you guys have seen from just kind of being on the market. Please stay. I would love to have you guys on for this next segment as well. Uh, we're going to bring on the rest of the crew. Uh, two of them have been waiting throughout the whole episode to come on, so we'll bring them in here. Uh, of course, joining us, Joe Farsing from the Bengals show here in the Riverfront. What's going on, fellas? Happy early holidays. The president of the Riverfront himself, Chad Dotson. How dare you keep me waiting? <laughs> you text me and said, don't put me on till draft time. It's true. So don't, it's true. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> good, good to be here. And then, good of to course, be here, guys. our NKU beat writer, also a member of the NBA Friday podcast. Two weeks me. in a row, dude. Like, this is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> we got Sean Mackey in the building. What's up, buddy? What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm excited about this. So before we move on, Chad, Joe, like I said, you guys were kind of hanging out in the pipeline there. Any thoughts from the draft conversation? There? Anyone you got more excited about the Reds potentially getting a two after that convo? It's the week before Christmas. The draft is in the summer, and none of these guys are going to be on the Reds until 2026, 2027. I don't care. It's awesome <laughs> that they finished in second place, you know, or finished with the second draft pick. And when it gets closer to that time of year, I'll be excited. But right now, eh. <laughs> Good will will any will any of these guys be playing for the Reds in 2024? If not. 
I appreciate the uh, expertise in talking with these guys, and uh, at least one of them I'm going to love in a, six months from now. But uh, I'm more interested in Christmas songs. There we go. <laughs> That's why everyone's here today, right? That's the real reason. Of course. Yeah. All right. So before we do get this going, here are the rules of the Late Night Reds 2023 Christmas Song Draft. And everything goes well. We'll make this a yearly tradition. All right. So five rounds. Everyone's going to get five picks. The amount of people on this screen are hilarious, by the way. <laughs> Cannot get enough of the laughter if you're seeing this many people here. So each draft selection will take the song and the artist of that. So, for example, if you take a Nat King Cole song, Nat King Cole's off the board and that song, no other renditions of that song can be drafted. So you're basically getting two and one, and the draft order will be randomly selected. So, gentlemen... Are you ready to see where you're selecting in this draft? Also, I forgot to mention, it is a snake draft. So if you are seven, you will do the wraparound. You guys ready to see how we do? Let's, let's um, do it. All right. So I guess I got to go over here, actually. All right. The seventh pick goes to Jack, representing Miami of Ohio and Chicago, Illinois. At number six, we have me. Oh, don't like that. All right, we're going to rerun this. <laughs> <laughs> we know it's not rigged at least there you go at five we have ben the two hosts are this late come Crazy. on now come on at four we got jackson come on, come on. at three we got joe oh we're down to who's we're down to Ch chad and Chad's sean down. all right who's gonna be the reds and who's gonna be the guardians at number two we have chad dotson so Sean the Reds. will be starting our draft. Hang on. Why does it say we only have one ball? Because I made sure everyone had the same <laughs> amount of stuff. Um, oh, no. <laughs> Joe. Joe. Oh, oh I, I, okay, I got you. It's the pink. Okay, oh. sorry. I, you know, I, th I thought you talked to my urologist. I just wanted to be sure. It's sorry, guys. No, it's a family show. <laughs> All right, so Sean, you get the first pick. How you feeling? You feeling good? I am. I, I didn't expect to get the first pick. I have a lot of deep cuts already uh, already assembled on my list from my, my personal uh, playlist that I have on my Plex uh, server here. So I'm... Uh, I know I'm nothing about that Plex server, by the way. Never even I know. On. I know. Well, you know what? You would you would love my Christmas mix, Tim. You would love it. I believe All it. in stunning, uncompressed sound. Exactly. All right. So we ready? Ready for this? You guys ready? Should we get started? Let's do it. Right. Let's roll. All right. Okay. So I've thought about this, and this there was, I've had some difficulty. I, if I if I got this spot, I was going to have some difficulty, and now you put that on me on what I'm going to pick. But I, I'm going to pick. Put it on you. Okay. Well, I'm going to pick the the song that I always have as the first song on every one of my Christmas mixes since like 2005, and I'm going to go ahead and take from Elvis Presley's original christmas album the best one i'm taking santa claus is back in town elvis presley is already off the board at number one but santa claus is back in town it's a great song i do love it it's it's a it's a banger is that different from santa claus is coming to town it is oh yes yes okay you'd so, know it if you heard it ben <laughs> chad before you pick i just have to make mention because uh the mia report is officially conceded uh, completed we have seen him he is back papa gooch is back guys we haven't seen him since like <laughs> july hey, what's oh up, my god Pat? pat's here what's up welcome back buddy where you where have you been is the real question but we're gonna let chad draft what you tell us so chad with the second pick there will be some who say this i'm i'm drafting this a little higher than it should have been drafted to which i say you're out of your mind this was my number one overall pick on my personal draft list, on my uh, personal draft board that I have on the wall in front of me here. It's Christmas in Hollis by Run DMC. You just <laughs> my whole big plan. Chad, that's, hey, that's why you're my dog, Chad. That's you know it. You dog. know it. Yes, sir. The greatest oh. Christmas song of all time. <laughs> it was featured in the greatest Christmas movie of all, all time, Die Hard. Die Go Hard, look it up. Absolutely. He and did it. Just, he did it. What, what, what are you gonna say? This is just the uh, it's the greatest Christmas song of all time from the greatest uh, you know greatest artists of all time. Rev Run, Daryl Mack, come on, Jam Master J, Christmas and Hollis. 
off Love the board. It. Good stuff. Love it. Perfect. That's that's fantastic. I really wanted that pick, so I'm very upset with you, but we'll let it slide. All right, brings on old Jackson. What you got, buddy? Oh man. I didn't even know I was Wait. a part of this, so I'm just Did it did I get that wrong? Is it Joe then Jackson? Who's next? Yeah, I thought We're... I Did someone keep a track of this? I thought I was third. Okay, I, yeah. Four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna okay. say God. Invite me on your show and then you forget me. By the way, if this were the Brady Bunch Matrix, I would be uh Carol Brady. She has the top, you know, the, the, the top middle row, so that's that, that's pretty good. I, I appreciate that. Oh. Um so sticking with my hard rock roots, I am doing Carol of the Bells by the Trans Siberian Orchestra. That's like major dad energy right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Damn lutely. Yeah. Major dad energy. I like it. All right, Jackson. Now you can come hang out. Okay. I'm here. All right. I'm going. I believe this is. I went to get a Big B coffee the other day. The question on the chalkboard was what's the most streamed Christmas song of all time? And I guessed and got it right. So I'm going. All I want for Christmas is you, Mariah Carey. You yep. did it. He did it. Absolutely. There the it classic. is. The classic. It's a classic. There it's a it is. Free. First rounder. Yeah. That it's is first definitely first rounder. First yeah. Had to be four. first round. Yeah. All right. So, Ben, it's you. Oh, this should not be a surprise. I am taking the greatest boy band group of all time, the Jackson Five, and hitting Santa Claus is coming to town. Nice. The the definitive version. Nicely of that done. Song. The the definitive version. Absolutely. You're right. And you're oh, also man. pissing off Chad because he was going to take the uh, Bruce Springsteen version when his time <laughs> came back around. <laughs> I, it was on the board. It was on my board. No, it was it was it was probably the um, Bruce Springsteen version. I would say. Yeah. <laughs> I had it on my board, so I like it. All right, yeah. so I'm up now, and I'm going to take a definitive version of another song. This was recorded in the beautiful city of Cincinnati, Ohio, part of old Phillies Records, Christmas Baby Please Come Home by the legend Darlene Love. Oh, nice. Nice. That was that was Nicely gonna be my done. that was gonna be my second pick. So you, that was the debate. Elvis yeah. or that one. Yeah, dude. It's like but it's I I have like I actually have that record. It's one of my favorite vinyls to play during the holidays, so I had to go with it. So Jack, you've got the wrap around here on the snake ski, so all right. So for my first pick, um I'm gonna go with an absolute classic. I heard it today. I was at the Blackhawk team. And it was played. I thought it has to be number one. Uh, Rocket Around the Christmas Tree by Brenda Lee. Love it. Shout out nice. Home Alone. Nice. Do you, get, do you guys know how old she was when she recorded that song? I do. I do not. I, I was blown away by this. She was 13 years old. 13, when she I thought, right? Yeah, Holy crap. Old. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. And then my wraparound pick. I'm going foreign language here. I'm taking Felice Navidad. <laughs> You guys, I hate having the six pick. I hate having this. I don't think it's going to make, make it back to me in round three. Which so version are you picking? Jose Feliciano. Got to be Jose. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. The, the original. Yeah. The original. Any other any other uh, answer would have been wrong on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <come on. laughs> Absolutely. All right. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna shout out the beautiful city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with this pick. I'm going to go Jingle Bell Rock by the Legends Hall of Famers of Daryl Hall and John Oates. I think they did the best version, honestly. So, Okay, okay. I actually didn't even have that on my list anywhere. I don't know how I skipped that, but... That's a a deep cut for me, Tim. Ooh. Ooh. Well, I I suspected that you were going to have some sort of like Echo and the Bunnymen Christmas song no one heard, so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't i don't i don't think echo and the bunnyman had recorded any christmas songs tim i mean the smashing pumpkins did one so let's just go they, ahead and they did. Tell, anything's possible they did. they did from disney world <laughs> yeah exactly that brings us to benny i want to go uh with another classic old blue eyes frank sinatra with let it ah. snow let it snow let it snow Ah, that's a goodie. Can't beat that. Yeah, we're not wasn't, friends, man. Wasn't, th- wasn't that version <laughs> also in Die Hard? I believe it was. Of- yeah, is that the one? It was the- Frank. Yeah, it was Frank Sinatra. I believe it's Frank. It's not Dean. Okay, cool. No, yeah. 
every time I hear the title of that song, I think of the uh, Saturday Night Live sketch where Alex, or where it was um, Sean Connery, and it was instead of Let Us Know, it was Late Tips Now. All right, we're back to Jackson here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so I grew up with an older sister in the late 90s, early 1000s. And I don't know if I love this song or hate it, but I'm going Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays in sync. I love it. I oh love the play. God. I okay. love, love the play. It. Okay. Very solid. This is getting fun. This is getting fun with Joe coming in now. I'm going with an old one. The Christmas song, Nat King Cole version. Ooh, That's a good okay. one. There, there. The the people with voices as smooth as that man. It, it it's an incredibly, incredibly short list, and every time that song comes on, like it's it's just, it gives me the feels. So, I like it. We got first, Chad. Oh. All right. So you know, I I was hopeful. The, what's funny is that uh, Sinatra, I was hoping Sinatra would get back to me. I had a different Sinatra song. As the elder statesman, you should have left Sinatra to me, uh, Ben. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I was going to choose a different Sinatra song, but that didn't happen. So let's go with another another uh, old one, another uh, um, sort of classic. It's uh, Andy Williams. It's the most wonderful time of the Ooh. year. Yes. You know this song? Well played. It's classic. You well heard played. it. That is that is yeah. amazing. Great call. It was what in a, a very uh, not Sinatra, but famous uh, Staples commercial, wasn't it? Many yes. at one point. That yeah. was a uh, back to school commercial. Oh, yeah. yeah, back to school. Yeah, yeah. That was That's fantastic. Right. I think it was in a Simpsons episode too. So, of course it was. Yeah, of course it was. Simpsons did it first. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like my favorite South Park episode that they've ever done. The Simpsons <laughs> did it. <laughs> All right, Sean, so you got the next two because you got the wraparound. All right. Well, I am going to take a song that was featured in my favorite Christmas movie of all time, Home Alone. Um, I'm going to take what I refer to as the definitive version of White Christmas by the Drifters. Nice. Okay. Okay. Nice. I like it. All right. Love the Drifters. yeah, I'll, t- I'll take I'll take an oldie there. All right, uh, for my next pick, ooh, this one's gonna be tough. Um, I'm actually gonna go with a song from my favorite Christmas album of all time, favorite artist of all time too, and it's a deep cut. And no one else is gonna pick it, but I'm gonna take it anyway because it should be on here. It's uh, "Merry Christmas, Baby" by the Beach Boys. Ah, oh, I had little Saint Damn. Nick. On, I had little Saint Nick on the board. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Same. Merry Christmas Baby's better. It is. Okay, so I'm up now. Uh, I'm going to go yep. with yes, sir. Christmas Time is Here. This is uh, by the Vince Garaldi Damn. trio from the, from yes. Char- uh, Charlie Brown Charlie Christmas. Brown, you all, yes. We've all seen that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. And yeah, the latest Arrested Development now. gag, running gag ever. The Arrested Development <laughs> exactly, gag yes. makes it even bigger. <laughs> Christmas Time is Here. Classic. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so this one, I don't know how many people have actually heard this. Um, it's kind of, I don't know if it's called a medley, but it's uh, God Rest You Merry Gentlemen and We Three Kings by Bare Naked Ladies and yep. Sarah McLaughlin. Absolutely oh, fantastic. Ooh. Love that song. A lot of Canada rep, uh, represented there. Um, yes, so that's, I, I don't know I don't know how long that song has even been out, but it's friggin' fantastic. Or the what a medley piece, whatever the hell you want to call it. I, I like it. I like it. We got for his Lauman. All right. It was, is Bing Crosby off the board? Nope. No. Okay. This Do is it. my son's favorite song because he has no idea what it's saying. So, Mele Kaliki Maka, Bing Crosby, <laughs> going with that one. And the Andrews sisters. Nice. Christmas vacation scene. Can't beat oh. it. <laughs> Can't beat it. Awesome. All right. Benny. We're going to go with a little Michael Bublé. Oh. And it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I like it. I really thought that was going to fall to me. (laughs) (laughs) Were were you going to take the Bublé version? 
Oh, I was. It was sitting right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's wonderful. Nice. Okay. Nice. Well, that means Ben's up now. No, Ben just went. Sorry. I just, I'm, yeah. I'm losing track of my own draft, guys. So, come Chad, on. Chad. Chad took my Chad took my number one, but I had a backup song for my next hip hip hop song, and I got to go the TLC version of Slay Ride because the Left Eye Freestyle Ooh. Rap is yes. unbelievable. That's good. Um, and we'll learn too. Yep, that song never disappoints. Never disappoints. That's a good pick. I really thought I was going to have that pick at seven. So I'm. <laughs> he's, he's like, dang it. All my songs. <laughs> I'm really scrambling here. Um, yeah. We're going to go with. We're going to go with Rudolph the Resident Reindeer. Because I really do not have another pick. Which do you version? have an artist? I'm working on that right now. <laughs> go, is Gene Autry on the board? He's on the board. Yeah, he's on, the, right. board. on the board. He's on the board. Rudolph. Rudolph Gino. That's that's, that's nice. the right answer. That is the right answer. Yes. And yep. then on my turn, I'm gonna go with. I'm surprised this one made it this far, considering how timely it is. Um, I'm gonna go with the Fairy Tale of New York. Oh, oh, yeah. oh nice. Yeah. 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 That's the going. That's a good nice. one. Nice. All right. So I'm really upset because here, I had the artist in mind, but there was two songs that I really had for them. So I'm trying to decide which one I want to go. But artist, I'm going Stevie Wonder. Oh, you son of a buck. <laughs> and I'm gonna go Gosh, dang it. <laughs> I'm gonna go I'm gonna go someday at Christmas. Oh Tim, you're killing me. You are flipping killing me. No one I pick next. Gosh, dog it. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> we know each other too uh, well. <laughs> yes, we do. Now, now I was gonna say, now I gotta scroll and find my next song. And my next artist. <laughs> uh, this is exactly how I felt about two picks ago. Well, this is like the the artist thing was Joe's rule that he put in on a live episode, so I couldn't be like, no, we're nah, stuck yeah, with this. I'm sorry. Good, yeah. <laughs> no, my, we're my, good. my apologies, my apologies. I screwed nah, it all up. No, nah, we're good. We're good. We're good. Um, so I will go. Uh, Kenny Loggins. Oh, celebrate, celebrate me home by Kenny Loggins. That's a that's a banger. I'm a big Loggins guy. Good pick, yeah. Man. I say Sean's like pulling up on Spotify his yacht rock Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been another artist who sung as many theme songs for soundtracks as Kenny Loggins? I mean that that no. guy owned the entire decade of the 1980s. Yes, he, he did. did. Just fantastic songwriter, and then and all those songs. I mean, Danger Zone. Uh, I'm all right. My good lord. Yeah. All right, Jax, what are you thinking here, man? It's getting it's getting slim in round four. It is it is getting slim. Who's up? Is it me? You. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm keeping it kid version again. I'm going. I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Couldn't have told you who sang it. Her name is Gayla Peavy. And she was 10 years old when she recorded that song. Oh. Boom, wow. There you go. Little, little actual factual. I like it. Yeah. All right, Joseph. Run, Rudolph, run by Chuck Berry. Nice. Oh, nice. Great Damn song. it, that, Joe. That was like I said, that, <laughs> that was on my list, too. I have my top four songs that I had on my list. I've got to pick them all, so. Either I'm picking a lot of really arcane songs or i'm just not popular you're just you're just joe we understand probably right, probably yeah, you're, saying, yeah. you're you're a little different um yep. all right so it's my my pick right yep all right so i'm i know this artist is still on the board it is uh horatio sands jimmy fallon chris Catan, and tracy morgan from saturday oh. night Live. Yeah. oh I wish it was Christmas today. If yes. you haven't seen it, Google it. Yes. Now. yes. It's amazing. Da, 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 there you go. Da, 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 da. Yeah. That's a good That's one. Awesome. That's a good one. <laughs> so, oh, Sean, yeah. ending round four and starting round five. We're in the final round after this pick. Woo. All right. Um, 
I'm actually going to go with a uh, hold on a second here. All right. So, I'm going to go with this. I don't think someone's taken this one yet, but this is a this is a classic that was actually recorded here in Cincinnati uh, by artist Charles Brown. Please come home for Christmas. Gotcha. Oh man, I had the Eagles oh. version on my board. The Eagles. Same. Yeah. yeah. No, you're you're all wrong. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. This is all the right. Cincinnati podcast, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Touche. Touche. All right. All right. Uh, my next pick that I'm going to do um, here. Man, you guys have picked some good ones. Um, I'm actually going to shake it up. This is my, this might be a little bit controversial. Wow. Um, so here it is. I'm going to go with. Uh, uh, all right. I'm going to go. Controversial, you have an answer. <laughs> okay. It's going to be the Jimmy Eat World version of last Christmas. Oh, over the Wham version. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, do, okay. I like both versions a lot, so I would have been happy either way. Okay. I can't believe that's okay. still on the board. I know. Um, it's controversial. I know. I know. We, yeah, you can see as well. We're just all it. It was <laughs> rage. I, I knew. I, I knew no one was gonna pick it though. <laughs> all right, we got Chad with his final pick. Well, that's my final pick. I knew no one was gonna take this one, so I'm. I'm just, I'm just gonna do it. It's. And again, this is uh, from the '80s. This is uh, from uh, Band Aid. Do they know it's yeah, Christmas? Not to eighty four. I had it it's, on my uh, list actually. To raise money for the uh, the famine in Ethiopia, do they know it's yeah. Christmas? I was hoping yes. that would uh, come back to me in my final round. That was uh, that was on my list. It's a jam. So. It's a jam. It's a, well, it's not really a jam, but it's a <laughs> legendary uh, legendary it is song. Legendary, though. Also, yes, Bare Naked Ladies did a cover of that, and it's very good. Yeah, but the Band Aid, the original Band Aid oh, yeah. version. Come on, you can't tell. I know. I'm with mm -hmm. you. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> All right. All right, if I were following my board and my fifth song that I listed is still available, uh, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, but I, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to pull the trigger. I'm going off the board. Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer by Elmo and Patsy. There we go. There we go. I like it. I like it. All right, Jackson, round up your lineup here. Round out your team. All right, I had like, I still had like three left and I didn't know which one, but I'm going to go. One of my favorite Christmas movies, and I think this is still available, the song is Believe by Josh Groban on the Polar Express movie. Good pick. Fantastic pick. Banger. Good pick. Not really a banger, but a great song. Yes, Good voice. Yes. Yeah. So that puts us at Ben for your last pick. My last pick. I'm going to go with another old crooner, the legendary Tony Bennett singing My Favorite Things. Oh, nice. Nice song. Like it. Yeah. All nice. right. My last pick. I'm going the legend Mavis Staples, the Christmas vacation theme song. Yes. Oh, so good. I like it. Perfect. I heard that in the grocery the other day, but I think it was a cover version. And I was like, what is this? You're like, who is singing this? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I didn't know we did cover versions of this, but whatever. It's a good song. All right, so that means, Jack, you're the final pick. No pressure. Joe, I really appreciate you not taking your mean one, Mr. Grinch, because that was <laughs> my only option here, and I did not have a fallback. So You're I very welcome. You're mean one, Mr. Grinch, and I will uh, use the artist Thurl Ravenscroft. Perfect. Is there a greater name for someone with that voice than Thurl Ravenscroft? Oh, really fantastic. No. <laughs> Just perfect. So, did anyone by chance write all these down for when I make a graphic later? Because I forgot to. I tried to. I, I have my picks. I can, I can send them to you. <laughs> yeah. If you guys have your picks, uh, feel free to send them to me, and I'll make a graphic to put up on the socials. Because we got to get our we got to get the community in here. Uh, I am going to preface one thing since it's been such a hot button. Um, I for sure wanted to take wonderful Christmas time, but the fact that I thought everyone was going to like chase you with pitchforks and burning today. <laughs> I ran away. Yeah, Tim, I, I wanted, Tim, I wanted to tell you this so bad. Literally right before I hopped on, I got a news update from my news app and it said, 
most hated Christmas songs of all time. <laughs> and that was the first one on there. And I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's it's hated on way too much. I don't think it's half as bad as as people make it out to be. And I think people that just worked at the Gap during Christmas hate it. Yeah. I understand. I worked retail during Christmas, so I know yeah. I know the bad Christmas songs out there. Trust me. Queens, thank God it's Christmas. Not good. I love Queen. Not good. Not good, Bob. Um, let's see. John Lennon's War is Over. Not good. Love John Lennon. Not good. Not good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we can go through Earth, this. Eartha Kitt, Santa Baby. I like the Kylie Minogue. That, that, that should have that should have been whose version? Kylie Minogue. I like Kylie Minogue. Yeah, like as, a, as a child of the '80s, man, she. Whew. Right. Well, yeah. Sean just mentioned Madonna, bruh. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much. Girl lives, now. Holly Jolly. Yeah. She's like 87 years old, isn't she? <laughs> Feels like Something it. Like she's not that old, but I mean, she, she's not young. Yeah. And also, I'm gonna go ahead and put this out there real fast because I know, with if we put the graphic up, someone will go, no, blah blah blah, blah blah blah. There's seven of us on a podcast. We didn't have much time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so please do not yell at us about whatever. This is a fun thing we wanted to do to end the hot end season. So gentlemen, this was incredible. Actually, like the fact that we got this podcast out with it, like just a little over an hour is amazing. So thank you all for going along with the silly idea I had. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, thank you all so much for everything this year. Uh, moving late night reds to the riverfront was the best decision I've ever made content wise. And also be able to bring your riverfront. You evolved. I just want to say thank you guys for making that something where the riverfront can support that as well as me, Sean, Jack, we can all attest to you. Like we're putting a lot of work into our content right now. Um, we really appreciate it. Shout out a game today and he still did a podcast tonight. So, uh, we definitely appreciate that. Uh, check out Jack's work on Miami of Ohio at riverfrontcincy.com so I don't have to drive to Oxford all the time anymore. It's definitely appreciated. Um, I really do think it's a beautiful campus. Jack, is Millen Hall low key underrated because like the red carpet rig drapes on the on each uh, behind the basket? I kind of love that. It would be a fantastic arena if we would get some student attendance. Yeah, that's true. It would that's be a true. lot. The atmosphere has the potential to be absolutely fantastic if people would show up to the games, but it's tough to, you know, get any sort of atmosphere in a building where there's only about a hundred people showing up per, per game. So Millet's a fantastic arena. Can't wait to get more coverage out there for you guys. But yeah, show up to games. Yeah. Follow Jack on socials at Jack Mueller 15 that you see there on the socials. I'm sorry, Jack, not everything could be the Cintas center. <laughs> Low rent version of a uh, fifth third arena. Hey, everyone, check out before. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> hey, what did your team do? It's been tossed last week. And the last my, 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 thirty years. My team can't win on the road. My team is like, yeah, it was a long time ago when they won at Cintas. Everyone, check out uh, riverfrontcincy.com. We have a lot of awesome new articles in our shop, uh, especially for uh, Riverfront U. I uh, got some new Bengals stuff up, so it's a, there's a lot of cool stuff. Buy our stuff, rip our gear. We want to look cool. And also, biggest growth we found on the YouTube channel in months. That's what thank she you. said. So, thank you all so much for your continued support. Like I said, Ben and I are done till January. <laughs> Sorry, um, Chad. <laughs> because Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve both fall on Sundays, so we're gonna we're gonna enjoy the time. We'll be back January seventh, getting ready for pitchers and catchers, of course. So, Joe, nothing. You pulled it. That's what she said in my previous seven. Nothing for pitchers and catchers. I, I, I already disappointed. Stop. Stop. I already stopped. <laughs> I was gonna say I already disappointed Stop. Dan. I didn't want to I didn't want to disappoint him anymore. <laughs> all right, folks. Thank you all. We'll see you in January. Have a good one. Take it easy. <laughs>